My friends, it is our privilege to witness and to celebrate with three of our junior parishioners who are receiving their first Holy Communion today, and it reminds each one of us of the day when we received Jesus for the first time in Holy Communion. Pretty girls, come up over here so that everyone can see you. Come up over here, right here. Right here. Come on up. And turn around and face the people and lower your mask so that they can see exactly who you are. Lower your mask. Lower your mask. Take your mask off. Oh, that's who they are. Very nice. Everyone is happy for you today, and I'm sure you are excited and happy too. Isn't that right, kids? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, all right. Very good. Go back to your families before I auction you. <laughs> First Holy Communion. Our reflection today on the sacred scriptures. When we gather for worship, we are nourished in the mind so that we can prepare the heart. And the mind is nourished, fed, given good vitamins from the sacred scriptures. Book of the Gospels. This is what feeds the mind. And when we feed the mind, it filters down into the heart so that you and I can open our hearts with faith, with faith to celebrate the presence of Jesus Christ and to receive him in Holy Communion. And so our reflection is the nourishment of the mind which reaches the heart. The Old Testament hundreds of years before Jesus, then the Gospels in between, and then the New Testament letters to the churches. In our readings, we have the Old Testament, the reading to the churches, and then we come to the Gospel. But in, in practical time, Old Testament, Gospels, then the reading to the churches because it was only after Jesus' death and resurrection that the church began to spread and that his message was given to the whole world by the apostles and those who ministered on behalf of Jesus. So we got that little detail there. Old Testament, Gospels, New Testament. In the Old Testament, which is comprised of different kinds of literature, the first reading was from the Book of Kings, a historical book based firmly on the history of the people and how God interacted in their history. It was all pieced together. The thread that joined all of this fabric of the revelation of God is faith. People believed God is present. You believe, I believe, God is present. In this historical book, there were two, two writings in the Old Testament. One was called First King, and then another one, Second Kings. This is from the first section, First Kings. The prophet Elijah was told by God, when you say told by God, it's like you and I being told by God to follow a certain pattern of life and decision, and no one else knows it. You know it. I know it. And we only believe uh, that God is speaking with us. If you take the faith out of it, there's no contact between God and you, God and me. The prophet was told, he, first of all, he sought him to, to live in a cave separated from the people, so that he can concentrate on what he thought was God's message to him to forewarn the people that if they leave the life of sin 
they will come into the life of goodness and grace. So when he was in the cage, in the cave, sorry, excuse me, when he was in the cave, he received a message, I'm going to come and visit you. And then he thought, well, how is this going to happen? Now, usually when something unusual happens, even with the weather, you say it and I say it, it's unusual even with the weather. We get a little shaken up. And if it's very bad, we say to ourselves, well, is God trying to tell us something? Think about it. You've said it, I've said it. Is God trying to tell us something? Now, listen to these three extraordinary natural events that were to signify the presence of God for the prophet. The first was a strong wind. And the next was an earthquake. The third was fire. And in all of these, Elijah never seemed to experience the presence of God. In fact, he came out of his cave to look around, and when he looked around, he saw these unusual natural happenings, but for some reason, it didn't touch his heart that God was present there. So he was kind of disappointed. He said, am I hearing correctly? Am I following correctly my instincts which tell me that God is going to visit with me? And so he went back into the cave. And then he got a message to come out again, and he stood at the mouth of the cave. That's exactly how it's described in literature. The entrance to the cave is called the mouth of the cave. So he stood over there, and he was afraid. Now what's going to happen? Wind, earthquake, fire, now what? And there was a gentle movement of air, a whispering sound of breeze. And then he said, maybe God is in this. So in the presence of God, he didn't feel that he, he was worthy enough to stand in his presence. So he took his cloak and he covered his face. Because he's in the presence of God. And he felt that presence in a gentle, whispering breeze. Let's move over hundreds of years now to Jesus and the Gospels. The deacon read for us very well that Jesus came walking on the water towards the apostles who were in a boat. And what did they think first? This is a ghost. This is some kind of spirit. And they were afraid. And what did Jesus say to them? Do not be afraid. It is I. And they recognized the voice. And guess what? Just like the prophet put God to the test, so does Peter put God to the test, the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Peter says to him, if it is really you, tell me to come to you. Now mind you, they're in a boat, they're on the water, a stormy, the stormy sea as they say, but it was a large, large lake, still there today. You couldn't see the other side, so it almost felt like the ocean, the sea. I remember how that, uh, how that feels because I lived in Indiana for many years, and uh, not too far away from the southern part of Michigan, and then Michigan has the largest body of water that looks like an ocean, Lake Michigan. Lake Michigan. You stand on one side, you couldn't see the other side, so you think you're facing the sea. Lake Galilee was like that. Such a large body of water. 
And when the winds begin to act, the waters get ruffled up. The boat was going from side to side. They were all afraid, even though Peter himself was a fisherman and he lived his life on the water. But they were afraid. And Jesus comes towards them. And they said, Oh, now what's happening? Now what's happening? And Peter puts Jesus to the test. Our first reflection is that we too are tempted to test God. So we learn God is God. He's going to pass any test that you and I wish to impose. Peter tested Jesus. Mind you now, they were chosen, but at that time they hadn't developed in their heart a total uh, attachment to the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Gradually they began to learn, this is just no ordinary person. This is not just a prophet who's giving us the word of God. This is God himself, the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Peter puts him to the test. If it's really you, he says, tell me to come to you. That was Peter's first mistake. <laughs> if it's really you, tell me to come to you. And Jesus said, come on. And when Peter got out of the boat, he was vacillating between faith and human reason. When he got out of the boat, he began to feel, oh, this is very rough water. Now, this is the man who lived his life on the water fishing, who in, under any circumstances could swim. But he was afraid. And Jesus said, don't worry. He held on to him. And they both got into the boat again. That's the description that the deacon proclaimed for us in the gospel. My brothers and sisters, what do we learn? What do I learn? I'm sharing with you what I have learned. Not that my learning is top of the line, but it's a human yearning for God just like you. We're in this world together. Priest or no priest, it's faith. What do I learn? What do you learn? First, God is God. We cannot control God. Sometimes we try to. As I've often said, many of us would like to be on the consulting committee to tell God how to run the world. <laughs> and everybody wants to be the president of that committee. God is God. Second, we don't test God. God tests us. We don't say like Peter, if it's really you, you do this and you do that. No, 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 no. That doesn't work. He's in charge. We're in charge of other little de details in life, but we're not in charge of everything. We don't tell God, you do this and you do that. That was Peter's first mistake. He should have stayed in the boat anyway. You know. But he said, tell me to come to you. And when he got out of that boat, and began to test God, the waters frightened him. How many times in your life and in mine? There are circumstances and events that are far beyond what our human capacity is. And we even ask the question, is God trying to tell me something? But he may not talk with us through strong winds and, and hurricanes and cyclones or through earthquakes, but he may be talking to you and to me in a gentle, soothing breeze. And oftentimes, we fail to say thank you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit,